Professor Baumgart is a, a numerical relativist who has made uh, really pioneering contributions to the whole field of um, numerical relativity, including but not restricted to the, the BSS and formalism, which stands for Baumgart, Shapiro, Shibata, and Nakamura. And this is um, one of the two successful formalisms in, uh, in formulating Einstein's equations that made them amenable to numerical simula simulations of various astrophysical objects like binary systems, et cetera, that we, we, we use and, and, and to do various studies of astrophysics. Um, apart from his very important and wide contributions to uh, numerical relativity, uh, Professor Baumgart is an excellent teacher and is uh, author of one of the most um, important books, textbooks in numerical relativity, along with uh, Stu Shapiro. In fact, last year, he brought out another book uh, on numerical relativity targeted to undergraduate students. And, um, and, and you would see how excellent lecture he is uh, in, in, in 10 minutes. Um, we also have a little bit of personal history also, which I would like to share. Uh, this is the 11th edition of the summer school, ICTS summer schools on, on and gravitational wave astronomy. And it started in 2013 and the topic, and we circle different topics of gravitational physics and astronomy every year. And it started in 2013 and the topic was numerical relativity. And uh, Thomas was the inaugural lecturer of the school. So we are, we are very excited uh, to, to see him back um, after 10 years. And uh, I won't take any more uh, time. Uh, but let me also acknowledge that this year, the school has been co-organized um, along with the Raman Institute, which has sort of uh, partnered with us. And uh, hopefully we'll continue this, this partnership in, in future also. So let me, without uh, any delay, invite Professor Baumgart. Good morning, everybody. Now, let me first ask, can you hear me? Is that... And I understand there are people online too and um, participating remotely. I would like to welcome all of you too. So I hope you can hear me too. So you just heard that my name is Thomas Baumgart. I grew up in Germany, but I've lived in the United States for many, many years. And um, it's a great honor to be invited back here. And it's also a great joy to be in this beautiful location. So it's, this is really wonderful. Um, and also, so basically I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me, but actually I would like to thank you for bringing all of us together. So I think we should start this off by thanking all the organizers for bringing us together here. So. Now, I will tell you a few things about me uh, that you should know. One is that I will not recognize you. So please, I apologize in advance for future events when uh, I may see you again, maybe at a conference, maybe even later over coffee or something. Even if you've introduced yourself to me, I will not recognize you. Don't take that personally. If you wonder what's going on, you should Google face blindness, okay? And if you want to hear some stories about inviting the wrong person to lunch or something like that, ask me about that, okay? It's, Anyway, that was a joke, but actually it's happened, but anyway. So, okay, my goal for these classes, for these five classes, to give you an introduction to, to the mathematical formulas of numerical relativity. And what I should tell you is, guess what? There are different formalisms, people use different approaches, and not all of them use exactly the same things. So depending on what you do, you may not need all of the things that we'll discuss here, but I believe that no matter what you do, you will use some of them. So I hope that everybody will find at least some parts of this useful later on. Also, I decided not to go through every proof in great detail. Frankly, I'm not sure it is a really good use of our time to do that because you can always look up proofs later on in a textbook. If you need a suggestion for a textbook, I may have some, okay? But um, so instead, I think it's it may be a better use of our time to talk about some of the concepts that you encounter in a more intuitive way. So basically my goal will be to actually develop some intuitive insights into these things you encounter in the context of numerical relativity. And actually by, I will do that by using a lot of analogies with Newtonian gravity, with electrodynamics, and even with scalar fields and other things. So, so that's how we'll develop that. So the plan for our week here, so today, we'll talk about a review of relativity. Okay, more on that in a minute. Um, tomorrow 
on, on Wednesday, we'll talk about three plus one decompositions in general. Okay, and basically, we'll, in the process, we'll encounter things like the, the lapse function, the extreme, the curvature, the shift vector, all these kind of tools that you may encounter in the context of numeric relativity. And by the end of that, we'll see how basically using a three plus one decomposition, the field equations split into constraint equations and evolution equations. Then on Thursday, we'll talk about various different techniques that we might use to solve the constraint equations. And on Friday, we'll talk about how we could solve the evolution equations. So that's, that's the plan, okay? Any questions at all so far? See, I did this on purpose to demonstrate to you that whenever I ask, are there any questions, there won't be any questions, okay? And that's why I never do that. That was the only exception just now. So that, what that means is you should never wait for me to stop and see, ask you, if, are there any questions? So if there are any questions, please ask them, raise your hand, make yourself clear that you have a question, interrupt me, okay? So let's keep this informal. Um, this is lovely stuff that we're talking about. So it's, it's fun to, to, to just enjoy talking about all of this. And, and I'm more than happy for you to participate in that, okay? All right, ready? Let's, excellent, let's get started. Let's talk about Newton's versus Einstein's gravity. And now first I need to find some chalk, there we go. So here's our chapter one. Let's start in the top right. So Newton's versus Einstein's gravity. Now mind you, of course, we won't have enough time today to really do an introduction to general relativity. That's not the goal of what I'm doing here. I'll review some of the things that we encounter in general relativity. I'll do that by making analogies with Newtonian gravity. So that's why I first talk about Newton's gravity. We'll skip many of the details, but what I'm hoping is that we'll see some relationships, which I find actually really insightful. Plus it's so much fun to talk about this. So. That's why we're doing that, okay? Now, basically, if we ask Sir Isaac Newton, tell us about gravity, Sir Isaac Newton will tell us, well, what happens is that if I throw an object, it will follow a curved path, okay? On the other hand, if we ask Einstein, Einstein would tell us, no, actually, it's a straight path. It just happens that the space is curved, okay? So what we'll try to tickle out what is going on here, we'll see where do these differences come from, okay? So we'll disentangle that. So let's first start with Newton's gravity. And I think I already saw some people squinting at the blackboard and what is that going? I know my handwriting is hard to read. So if you cannot read something, just let me know. You can, you can ask, right? Okay, so Newton would first assure us that there's a gravitational force. Gravitational. Okay. And he would tell us that, well, the gravitational force, maybe I'll write it as the gravitational force Fn, okay, for Newton, equals m, I'll write it as m times g, okay? And g is the gravitational field vector. Okay, so basically in ENM, it will be electric field vector. Here it's the gravitational, gravitational field vector. Okay, close to the Earth, the magnitude of that is 9.81 meters per second squared. That's what we mean by that, right? It's pointing down. And also what I'll do is I'll actually decorate this M with a G for the gravitational mass, because that will be important in a minute, okay? Gravitational, what I mean by the gravitational mass is that we only, it, now, we grow up thinking just about mass, but if you think about it, they're two different kinds of mass, and they really measure two completely different things, okay? So um, the, the gravitational mass is, tells us about how strongly an object couples to the gravitational force. How could we measure that? I could take an object. You know, I meant to bring a marshmallow because my wife claims that marshmallows are intrinsically funny, okay? but I forgot it, okay? So, but can you all picture a marshmallow? Okay, so here's our marshmallow and I could hang that marshmallow from the spring. We could just measure how much does the spring extend and that would tell us what the gravitational mass is. So it really measures how much does the object couple to the gravitational force. In electric fields, the equivalent would be a charge, right? We, a charge tells us how strongly does an object couple to the electric field. So that's what this MG is. 
Okay? We could also write this gravitational field G as the gradient of, strictly speaking, the negative gradient, according to convention, the gradient of some Newtonian potential. Okay, so, and now this D is the gradient. Now you may be confused, why do I use the capital D rather than the nabla symbol? And that's because I would like to reserve the nabla symbol for a four-dimensional gradient later on. So I'm just using the D for the um, three-dimensional gradient. And this Newtonian potential, Newtonian potential, that is actually what I will consider our fundamental prop, fundamental quantity here, fundamental uh, quantity. Okay. Now you could quibble with me with that. Well, why is it that the potential phi, not the gravitational force, particularly the gravitation potential phi, you could argue, well, that's defined only up to a constant, right? We, we can always add or subtract a constant from the gravitational field, but I was just so yet yeah, exactly right. That's exactly what a gauge freedom is for a scalar function, okay? And we'll come back to that, okay? So I'll claim for our purposes, it is actually makes very natural to consider this gravitation potential to be our fundamental quantity. And just, so I assume we've all seen some general relativity, probably we've all seen some vector symbols. What I'm doing here is just as a review, so we're revisiting old friends, but it's also a means of bringing us all to the same page so that later in the week we all know the same basic things that we've discussed. Okay? So one thing that we'll use is, the, is, is an index notation. So I could also write the exact same equation in terms of indices as minus di phi, where these i's now denote a spatial index. And then this component di when acting on a scalar function is just a partial derivative which I could write like this. And basically, in, as a shorthand notation, I might also write it just with a partial i, okay? So that all means the same thing here, okay? Now we could invoke Newton's second law. So this is the gravitational force. Now we invoke, invoke Newton's second law. Second law, which tells us that M times A equals Fn, okay? Now we have to be careful because this M, it's not the gravitational mass. What is this M? It's the inertial mass. How could we measure the inertial mass? Let's say we're in outer space, no gravity at all. We could exert some force on our mass. We measure the force. We measure the rate at which the object is accelerating. That tells us about what the inertial mass is. Notice there's no gravity involved. Has nothing to do with gravity. This had all to do with gravity. So this is a completely different quantity. A priori has nothing to do with each other. It's completely intuitive for us for electric fields, right? Basically, nobody would suggest to you that the charge has anything to do with the mass of an object. They're completely independent. But therefore, we will distinguish this and write this as the inertial mass, okay? So this is the inertial mass. This is the acceleration. And now Newton assures us, oh, by the way, the inertial mass and the gravitational mass, those are exactly the same for every single object, okay? No matter whether you consider a marshmallow or a bowling ball, it's the same, okay? So basically Newton now tells us that Mi is the same as Mg, okay? And actually, I'm sorry, I should have added this. The Fn we previously observed was minus Mg times uh, the gradient of phi, okay? So basically now this tells us that the, uh, uh, our e equation of motion becomes, now we can cancel out the two m's and we say, see that ai equals, what is the acceleration? Well, that's the same as the time derivative of the velocity, which is also the same as the second derivative of the position, okay, with respect to time that's minus, minus partial i phi, if I write it in, in these components, okay? And now I'll put a box around this. This is now our Newtonian equation of motion, all right? 
And what you notice is because these masses cancel out, assuming that they're the same, that means that all objects fall at the same rate. Okay, and that, of course, are these beautiful experiments that Galileo performed. He observed that all objects fall at the same rate, right? There are these stories about him. the leaning power of Tisa, whether or not that's true, I don't know, okay? But he certainly did make those experiments and he observed that, okay? And Newton was able to explain that. In the relativistic context, when we now refer to that as the uh, weak equivalence principle, okay? Now, does this mean that I can let an object fall, watch its acceleration, and measure from that the gravitational field or the gravitational potential? Not really, because we've, there's something funky going on about inertial frames. Imagine we were in a freely falling elevator, okay? We would have to export, perform this experiment pretty quickly because probably we don't have all that much time, okay? But imagine we're in a freely falling elevator. I let the marshmallow fall, okay? And guess what? According to us, it would just sit there, right? Because the marshmallow is falling at the same rate as the elevator, so it's not accelerating at all, okay? So we would conclude, well, the acceleration is zero. Does that mean that the gravitation field is zero? Well, not really. So clearly there's something funky going on. How do we account for that? We, well, in a Newtonian context, we would say, well, there's an inertial frame, before freely falling accelerator is not an inertial system. So basically what we would do is basically we would subtract something that would be the acceleration, the acceleration of the frame that we're in, okay? Now the question is, okay, but that's kind of funky. So this is apparently, you know, frame dependent now, okay? Basically these accelerations are frame dependent. We could now ask, can we do something to measure the gravitation field in the frame independent way, okay? The answer is yes. Any thoughts on how we can do that? We don't let one marshmallow fly fall, we let Typical hand movement, we let two marshmallows fall. Distance. Exactly, and we measure how the distance between the two marshmallow changes, actually. Let's go through that formally just to see what's going on, okay? So basically, the idea is now, uh, basic, for a frame-independent measurement, We want to look at the deviation of freely falling objects. Okay. And so the, here's the idea. Maybe I have one marshmallow here. Maybe I have another marshmallow here. Okay. And maybe I have one position vector pointing to my first marshmallow. Maybe this is the point the position vector one, and then I have a second position vector pointing to the second marshmallow. And then I have the, and maybe this marshmallow falls in this direction, this marshmallow falls in that direction. Okay, so now we measure the change in the separation between these two marshmallows. The separation is the difference between these two vectors. So that's delta xi, okay? Now let's compute the second time derivative of this delta xi. So d delta xi dt squared, that is by definition, the second time derivative of xi2 minus xi1. Okay. Now I can, basically what is that? Well, that's just the difference between the accelerations a2 minus ai1. Now I can insert our equation of motion, this one. Now the beautiful thing that you see is that the AI frame will cancel out. And it's in that sense that this now becomes a frame independent measurement. We get only the two terms, the, 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 the two terms from the phi's. Okay, so this is now the same as minus partial I phi evaluated at the position two plus partial I phi of, uh, uh, evaluated at the position one. Okay. What can we do now? 
What we'll do now is we'll assume that the separation is pretty small, and we use a Taylor expansion to express this partial I phi at two in terms of the, ter uh, the quantities at one, okay? So let's do, do that. Let's use a Taylor expansion. And let's do this formally because it also introduces some of the formalism and the conventions that I'll use. This is partial I phi evaluated at the position two is the same as partial, oops, partial I phi there, partial I phi evaluated at the position one plus now the leading order terms in the Taylor expansion. So that means I need to take a derivative of this term evaluated at position one. Okay, now we have in Cartesian coordinates, I will have a derivative with respect to X, one with respect to Y, and one with respect to Z. So I would have a plus a delta X times partial, partial X of partial I phi evaluated at one plus, and now you know what, I'll just use dot, dot, dot. It's the same terms just for Y and Z. And then basically there will be terms of order delta squared. Okay, delta x squared, something like that. So it makes sense? We're good? All right, so then let me write this in a slightly different way. Then I have partial i phi evaluated at one plus, now you notice I have three of the same terms just with x and y and z. So I can write this as the sum for i or j equals one, two, three. And then a delta x j, so that takes x for the first one, then the y and then the z, times partial j, partial i phi, evaluated at one, right? Plus order delta x squared, right? And now we use the Einstein summation convention by which we will drop the sum symbol whenever we sum over repeated indices. And that means we'll use as a shorthand for the exact same thing, just this plus delta xj partial j partial i phi at one, okay? Plus second order terms, all right? Okay. So this is the Einstein summation convention that I'm using there, okay? So now I can insert this Taylor expansion into my original deviation equation, we notice that the first term will exactly cancel out. And then what we have left over is just a second term, which second order term, which is, which is this one, okay? So what we end up with is D delta xi dt squared equals minus delta xj partial j partial i phi, Okay, so that's what we have. Now, this I will now in define as a new object. Okay, actually, does anybody have an intuitive feeling for what this term, this thing describes? It's not gravitational forces, gravit it's the tidal, it's tidal fields, right? So we call this the Newtonian tidal tensor. And so basically I call it tensor, uh, N, N for Newton and R for, <laughs> any idea where I'm going with this? Any idea what the relativistic equivalent of this thing will be? The Riemann tensor, so I'm already borrowing the R from the Riemann, okay? So this will be, is now minus N R I J delta X J, okay? And so we see that this is now tells us about how second derivatives evolve, and we see that it's the second derivatives of the potential that enters there, okay? So this is the tidal deviation equation. And it allows us to measure the gravitation fields, the tidal fields, and engage in varying way, okay? Now, the last step to do is to recognize, to, to think about, well, okay, this is fine. All of this is now in terms of derivatives of phi, but what determines phi in first place? Okay, now we have to go back and where does the phi come from? And that's actually from the Poisson equation. 
right? So the Poisson equation tells us that the Laplace operator acting on phi will be something like four pi rho, right? So from the universal law of gravitation, right? Newton's universal law of gravitation, we have that the that phi satisfies the Poisson equation, namely Laplace operator square, uh, equals four pi g times rho, and in a minute I'll set g to one, but let's leave it here for decoration. But look, look at something beautiful. What is the Laplace operator? The Laplace operator acting on phi, well, in Cartesian coordinates, that would be just partial second derivative of phi with respect to x, which I abbreviate as partial x squared phi, plus partial y squared phi, plus partial z squared phi, right? Okay, but what is that? That is actually the trace of the tidal tensor. The trace is the sum of the, 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 the diagonal components. So this is in fact the same, okay? I could write it in, as this, a partial i, partial i phi, okay? So this, this is, by Einstein convention, this would be partial x, partial x phi, plus partial y, partial y phi, and so forth. But we see that this is the same as the sum over the diagonal components of our tidal tensor, okay? And base this, that's what we call the trace, okay? The trace of a tensor. And we see that that's this, so I can just write this as r. Okay, so basically that means that our field equation, the Newtonian field equation, I barely have room for that here, it's nr equals four pi g times rho. Okay, so this is the Newtonian, I'll squeeze that in here, Newtonian field equation. Okay. And that basically completes our outline of Newtonian, Newtonian gravity. So let's, for easier comparison with what we'll find for a GR. Oh no, do we have an eraser somewhere? Is it? Oh, these are erasers? Ah, perfect, okay. Yeah, 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 okay, good, great. So let's write a summary of this. Okay, so basically we'll write a little table. We'll start with a fundamental quantity. Okay. And then we'll have a, a basically, I'll make a table like this, then I'll write as the next entry the equation of motion, then the deviation equation, and then the field equation. That was our logical procedure here, okay? So basically for each one, I will also write the relation to the fundamental quantity. Of course, for the fundamental quantity itself, there's nothing here, okay? And then we'll do this for Newton, and okay? And for Newton, basically, the fundamental quantity was the gravitation potential phi. Then we talked about the equation, equation of motion. The equation of motion involved the, the gradient of phi, so it involves the first derivative of the fundamental quantity. So this is the first derivative. And basically that involved the gradient of phi, right? That gave us the forces. The deviation equation we got by um, where did we get it from? We used the Taylor expansion. The Taylor expansion added the second derivative. So basically now we had the second, the de uh, deviation equation involves the second derivatives. Okay. And we wrote those in terms as the uh, Newtonian tidal tensor, which in terms of covariant derivatives would be the mixed covariant derivatives of phi. Okay. And then finally, the, for the field equation, we saw that we took the trace of the second derivatives. That gave us 
the trace of R, and that was equal to four pi G rho, okay? That was, the that was a quick outline of Newtonian gravity. Now what we need to do is add another column. We already put Einstein at the top. And now what we'll do is we'll follow the exact same outline and we enter the entries for the equivalent, the relativistic cousins, if you want, for all of these entries, okay? Now, where did this come from? So what was, you know, why, so now we'll switch gears, right? Now we'll talk about Einstein's gravity. Where did Einstein come from? Well, who knows where he came from, but we could summarize it at this. One big miracle in this whole development is this mi equals mg. And you could ask, oh, really? mi equals mg for every single object? That seems like a great coincidence, right? And you know, something, some coincidences are really coincidences, but others are not. So for example, when I grew up in Germany, there was a silly joke, okay? You need to understand that basically when you buy beer, at least in those days, when you bought beer in Germany, it came in a case of 24 bottles. And there was a stupid joke, 24 bottles in a case, 24 hours in a day, coincidence? <laughs> yes, that is a coincidence, okay? Einstein's genius, lay in realizing, on the other hand, that mi equals mg, that's not a coincidence, okay? That is a smoking gun. It tells us something profound about gravity, okay? So basically, wouldn't it be much more natural if you didn't want to buy this, okay? If you want to think that really sounds like a big coincidence, isn't there a more natural way of, of, of coming at the same conclusion? And that is the case if you assume that actually the trajectory of a freely falling object is not given by its individual properties, but rather by the properties of something that these objects share. So for example, if I have a marshmallow and I have a bowling ball, if I let them fall, okay, next to each other, they will fall at the same rate. It will be natural for them to fall at the same rate if what determines the rate of their falling are not the individual properties, but the properties of something that they share. What do they share? Think about it. The only thing that they share is the space through which they fall. That's beautiful, right? So basically that automatically leads you to think about, okay, so what we should think about, are there any properties of the space through which they fall that might determine their trajectory? Well, the only thing that you, you could, the property that you could attribute to the space is the curvature of the space. So it leads us really quite natural to think about, is it the curvature of space that actually determines the trajectory of these objects? That's beautiful, right? So let's think about that, okay? So, so basically, um, it, where am I here? Like, I'm, I'm all caught. So, so basically, I mean, one option would now be say, okay, I'm confused. What do we even mean by curvature of space? And actually, let's talk about that just for a minute. What the heck do we mean by curvature of space? If we have a two-dimensional space, we can picture that, right? Because we can think like a sphere, the surface of the sphere looks curved to us. Why does it look curved to us? Because our brains think three-dimensional. So really what we're thinking of is the Im embedding of a two-dimensional surface in the three-dimensional space, okay? And that we can picture as being curved, okay? But now let's imagine we didn't have that imagination. Maybe we were ants or something on this surface. How could we still measure? How could we measure curvature without even picturing it? Any thoughts on how would we do that? Yeah? Exactly. Okay. So that we, essentially, what we look for is any deviation from Euclidean properties. Okay. And one is we could measure triangles. Okay. And we could measure the deviation of the interior triangles from 180 degrees. Exactly right. Do you know this episode about Gauss doing that? Okay, so that's another way of doing it. We could also measure, we could measure, the, we could take a point, build a circle around the point, measure the radius. Let's say we go from the North Pole to some constant latitude, okay? 
measure the length of the circle, measure the radius, and we see is the ratio 2 pi or not, okay? And any deviation from 2 pi will tell us that too. But actually, to come back to the interior triangles, you all know about the mathematician Gauss, I assume. Did you know that, I mean, he did many things. One of the things that he actually did professionally was he was a surveyor. Did you know that? That's, he actually... Even so, when I grew up in Germany, there was a 10 mark, you know, back, back then was still German marks, and there was a bill that showed Gauss on the normal distribution on one side, and on the other side was a map of northern Germany with all the surveying that he did. Okay, so he was pretty good at that. And one thing that really fascinates me is even in the 1800s, he was wondering, well, can I measure deviations from flat space? So he went to three mountaintops and measures very carefully the angles between these mountaintops and checked whether they're actually 180 degrees or not. To the air to which he could do that, he did not see any, okay? But it is fascinating that long before Einstein and GR came along, he actually thought about that, okay? And he actually went out and measured that. Isn't that, isn't that neat, right? So anyway, so, so we could do that. Uh, we will actually develop a different formalism, the formalism of differential geometry to measure curvature. But the point of this is, Yes, we could, we could claim we're confused by not picturing curved spaces, but the point is we don't need to picture curved space. We can use the tools of mathematics to tell us about that. Okay? So let's uh, start with Einstein's theory. So now it's B, Einstein. Okay? And basically, we could measure angles. You said we could measure distances, lengths, circles. In order to measure length, we need a metric. Okay, so basically the first object that we introduce is the metric. Okay, so basically what, does, what is the job description for a metric? The job description is convert coordinate distances to proper distances, okay? I like to think about, for example, street numbers are perfectly fine coordinates. If you send a letter to a certain street number, it will arrive there, right? It's, it's per perfectly good coordinates, and yet, the difference in street number between your neighbor, okay, so for example, for we live at 58 Federal Street, our neighbor is at 68, 60 Federal Street, the difference is two. Clearly that two has nothing to do with the difference in our houses, okay? In order to get the physical difference between distance between the houses, we would need a metric, which converts the difference in our coordinates to the, the proper distances. That's what a metric does, okay? We often write it in terms of a line element, is a line element, okay. and that we, then we have G A B times D X A D X B. Okay, so where the D axes are now differences in position, the distance vectors. Now let me erase this, okay. and the, the metric converts these distance in coordinates to proper distances. Okay, so this is now a proper distance. Okay. And this is the metric. What kind of an object is the metric? It is a, it's a tensor. Actually, what rank tensor? Second rank tensor. I will now make the claim that this metric plays the exact same role in Einstein's gravity as the Newtonian potential does in Newtonian gravity. So in fact, I will already put down the metric as our cousin of the fundamental quantity here, okay? GAB, okay? Now, as a heads up, you notice that this fundamental property has, is two ranks higher a tensor than this cousin here. Guess what that will lead us? Everybody else will also be two ranks higher. So we will not be shocked if by the end of the class, we realize the equivalent here will be a four, a rank four tensor, okay? It comes out very naturally once you see how these objects correspond to each other, okay? All right, this is the metric. This is a proper distance and these are coordinate distances, okay? And this is basically, this is what I'll refer to as the fundamental quantity. of GR. Okay. A very simple example of a metric 
would be that of a flat spacetime, also known as the Minkowski spacetime, and that is the Minkowski metric, right? So in special relativity, GAB is flat. Okay. So that means I can write GAB equals eta AB, where eta AB is not a flat metric in whatever coordinate system that I use. Okay. For example, in Cartesian coordinates, coordinates, it would be eta AB equals minus one, zero, 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 and you get that right, and just these on the diagonal. Okay. And I will now set C equals one, okay? All right, and basically we could insert this into the line element, and then we would get the usual special relativistic line element minus dt squared plus dx plus dy squared plus dz squared. So it's like a Pythagoras just with the extra minus sign, okay? On the other hand, if we'd rather use spherical polar coordinates, then the metric would look a little bit different. Then we would have eta AB equals minus one, zero, 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 and then um, zero, one, zero, zero. 0, 0, r squared, 0, 0, 0, 0, r squared, sine squared, theta. And basically, actually, maybe I'll write down the line element in this case. We would get minus dt squared plus dr squared plus r squared times d theta squared plus sine squared theta d phi squared. And often we abbreviate this angular part as the solid angle omega squared, okay? Now you notice already that, well, the metric can actually, even though we have exactly the same space time, the metric can, can take different forms. This is not particularly disturbing, okay? Because you say, yes, we remember that. That's the whole coordinate freedom or gauge freedom. Now you remember that, aha, therefore basically, we discussed a gauge reading for phi too. The equivalent of the gauge reading for phi was the ability to add, subtract a constant to phi, okay? So we have a gauge freedom in both quantities, okay? Now, how about the equation of motion? That's the next step, right? Basically, as we are following the same outline, we now have to think about the equation of motion. What is the equation of motion in GR? Well, we've said that we will describe the movement of particles, by the particles falling th through this curved space. But we have not said nothing yet about how do they fall through curved space? What determines how they fall, okay? But there's a beautiful thing there too, because we've started by saying, we want to look for a way of describing this, so it applies to all objects. It applies to the marshmallow and the bowling ball, but also for a photon. It's why would we distinguish? It's all the same. And there's a beautiful thing. We already know what photons like to do. According to which principle? Whose principle are we referring to? Starts with F. Sorry? Fermat's principle, exactly. Starts with F and ends with Erma, right? So it's Fermat's principle, which tells us that photons take the shortest path possible. Now we say, well, Basically, we are not distinguishing between which particles follow these geodesics. So we'll apply that to all particles, okay? So again, it's, we're not making this up. We're using actually established physical principles to come up with this, okay? So basically, we, the equation of motion okay? basically, we, we will invoke Fermat's principle. We'll use, we'll, we'll postulate that objects will take the shortest path possible. What is the shortest path possible? Well, it's a path that doesn't bend, basically, by whatever we mean by that, or bends as little as possible, okay? So it's a path 
that does not not bend and the technical term for that is it's a geodesic so we will postulate that objects will follow geodesics in this curved space time okay so to think about what that means is we need to start with a path okay so maybe here's our path and i'll be kind of non-committal as to whether this is a three-dimensional path or a four-dimensional path in the space-time, okay? And at each moment in time, we can draw a tangent to this path, okay? Maybe here, basically there's the tangent to this path would be something like this, okay? And I'll call that the velocity, I'll call it u, okay? So this is the velocity, u a, okay? And now we'll introduce a concept that we'll refer to as parallel transport. We say there's maybe another vector, maybe it's this vector, okay? Maybe we'll call it AA. And we'll now transport this vector along this path. And we'll transport it in a special way and then we'll keep it as parallel as possible. That's what we call parallel transport, okay? So parallel transport. We will keep this another vector, AA, as parallel as possible. Okay. And then we define an operation, an object that tells us about deviations from parallel transport. What is that called? It's the well, you think about it while I erase this. What measures deviation from parallel transport? Did I hear covariant derivative? That's what I heard, right? That's what I heard, excellent. So it's the covariant derivative. Oops, covariant derivative. Okay. Which measures deviation. from parallel transport. So we write the, the covariant derivative along the velocity u as this is now where the Nabla operator comes in. So this will be u projected along the covariant derivative of this vector a. And basically if, uh, if this is zero, that is equivalent to saying that a a is parallel transported along you, okay? Now, what do we mean by a path that does not bend? A path that does not bend parallel transports the tangent along itself, right? In a straight path, the tangent would always point in the same direction. So that's what we mean by a geodesic. So basically in a curved space, a geodesic means that basically if rather than this A being parallel transported along U, U itself will be transported along U. That means it is as parallel as possible, okay? So a geodesic is then UB, nabla B, UA equals zero. This is the geodesic. And this is the equation of motion for our objects in this curved space. Okay. Now it's not totally obvious how to see the relationship to the Newtonian equivalent until we think about how do we actually evaluate this covariant derivative. And if, how do we do that? So we evaluate the covariant derivative. How do I do that? So I write the nabla b of a vector u a, okay? And the first term is the partial derivative of u b, u a, sorry. And then actually, does anybody know how I continue here? Just to calibrate for myself, <laughs> what the audience, yeah? yeah. Will you, 
Exactly, plus the Christoffel symbol, right? So basically we have plus the, uh, the as you write me as you see, and now the Christoffel symbol, A, C, B. Okay, so I copy the A over to the Christoffel symbol, I contract over a new index C with the old object and the derivative B appears in the bottom there. Okay, and you know what? I will put a four here because I mean a four dimensional space time Christoffel symbol. I'll use the four to distinguish the spatial Christoffel symbol that we'll encounter later. Okay, all right. So now we have to, you know, first we need to make some space here. Now we have to talk about how do we actually compute the Christoffel symbols? Okay, so with the Christoffel symbols, some, some, oh goodness. Okay, so there, gamma A, B, C equals, does anybody remember what they are? Yeah, so let's start with the one half and then G, A, actually then I get a new D and then I have all the derivatives and now I have to remember which one comes with the plus sign and the negative sign, right? So basically there's a partial C, G, D, B plus a partial B, G, D, C minus a partial D, J, B, C, okay? And basically, what, what is actually the job of these Christoffel symbols? Well, when we take a derivative, a covariant derivative of a vector, then we have to think about the vector really being a, a linear combination of basis vectors, so the coefficients and basis vectors. When we take a derivative of that in a covariant sense, we need to worry about both taking derivatives of the components, which we're doing here, and the basis vectors. That's what the Christoffel symbols do. So the Christoffel symbols measure the derivatives of the basis vectors. Therefore, this combination gives us a covariant derivative. Okay, so they measure the change of the basis or, basis or unit. Yeah, let me write basis vectors. Okay. Now, do you notice a beautiful analogy to Newtonian physics now? Well, the equations of motion for Newtonian physics involve the gradient of the fundamental property. Now, the equation of motion here is the geodesic equation, which is a covariant derivative, which includes the Christoffel symbol, which are the first derivatives of the metric, which was our fundamental quantity property. So there's a direct analogy, again, to Newtonian physics, okay? So let's enter, you know, that next entry here. So basically the equations of motion include the Christoffel symbols, A, B, C, A, B, C, uh, gamma A, B, C, and they, when we write them out, they include the first derivative of the metric exactly like the gradient of phi was the first derivative of phi, okay? So it's a beautiful analogy, All right? Okay, so basically what we observe here is that Basically, we have the first derivatives of G, A, B in the equation of motion. Okay, good. Now, you know what? I don't even know how we're doing on time. Uh, I, I, are we still good to go? Perfect, great. Um, usually I like to take a break in the middle, but because we had a late start, maybe we'll just go through today and then we can debate having a break for the rest of the week, okay? Um, but now you tell me, what should we do next? So we're following our footsteps of the development of Newtonian gravity. What do we need to do next here? We now need to talk about the deviation, okay? We realized that um, basically we do the same thing as before. We realized to, to, in order to get a, a, a gauge, a frame independent measure of the fields, we needed to look at deviation. Now it's geodesic deviation, okay? So let's write that down, okay? So we next, we talk about geodesic. Deviation. Okay. When we did this in Newtonian gravity, we evaluated the equation of motion of one particle in terms of a Taylor expansion 
over the position of the other. By doing that, Taylor expansion gave us an additional derivative of phi, remember? Guess what? If we do the same thing again, we get exactly the same thing. We do a Taylor expansion. You use a Taylor expansion about the position of one particle that gives us an extra derivative. We already have first derivatives of the metric. So guess what? We now encounter second derivatives of the metric, which is not shocking, given that also here we had second derivatives, okay? So basically, we, this in, includes a Taylor expansion, which we will skip, okay? But basically what's important, I don't care about the details here, but I think what is very important or very useful to have in mind is, is the analogies, the structures, okay? We can look up the details of what these second derivatives are. We can always look it up. Even if we wrote it down in a blackboard, we would forget, okay? But it's, it's, keep to, it's nice to keep in mind what the structure and what the analogies are, okay? So this will introduce second derivatives of GAB, okay? So things like partial R, partial B, GCD, but by the way, also all mixed derivatives, okay? Not, you know, so they come in all kinds. The beautiful thing is that we can then group those into a tensor, okay? It, because we end up with a tensor, a gauge invariant frame invariant equation, it must end up being a tensor. And that is the Riemann tensor, okay? So basically we group them into the so-called Riemann tensor. Okay. which I write as 4, R, A, B, C, D, where the 4, again, reminds us that I'm talking about the space-time Riemann tensor right now, okay? What is, what is the physical role of this Riemann tensor? If somebody asks you, tell me, what does, it, what does it mean? What does it describe? You told me, sorry? Curvature, true, but in a gravitational context, you told me earlier what this gravitational object, DIGJ phi meant, you told me that that was described tidal terms, right? Guess what? It's now the exact same thing. It's essentially relativistic tidal fields by analogy, okay? So basically we can already enter that into, um, in this, into the summary. We have the equivalent here will be the um, Riemann tensor, A, B, C, D. Okay, um, the Riemann tensor has lots of different symmetries, okay. has lots of basic properties, and I'm not sure I put, it made available, or I think the organizers made available a handout that I reached, and so you may have seen that there's um, basically there's several handouts. One is, um, I think it's called Important Results, which lists properties of all of these objects. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you seen that? Okay, so basically, to take a look at those, okay, so that lists all these symmetries and all these properties of the Riemann tensor, so I won't go over those right now, you can look those up. By the way, the, another handout is about tensor notation, so basically, we kind of slip into distinguishing between upstairs and downstairs indices, and contravariant and covariant indices, okay, if... Now maybe you're okay with that. If not, you can also, it, it is a brief summary in one of these handouts, you can read over that, okay? All right. Um, so now we have the Riemann tensor here. Now we could say, we, again, we're following the exact same footsteps as in a Newtonian case. What was our next question? We realized that this Newtonian tidal tensor described geodesic, the, the, um, the geodesic deviation or the Newtonian deviation. Then we asked what determines phi at first place, i.e. what is the Newtonian field equation? And we realized it is the trace of the tidal tensor, okay? So guess what? We don't need to make any guesses now. It's a beautiful thing. If we now want to know what is the field equation for our fundamental object, the metric, we know it must involve a trace of the Riemann tensor by analogy, right? Because in a Newtonian limit must give us the same thing. So we don't have a choice here, okay? So we not, must take a trace of this. Now you could get worried and say, oh boy, now there's so many indices, I don't know which trace to take because between the first two or the second, or how do I do that? Good news, because of all the symmetries, there's only one non-trivial one, okay? So again, we don't have to take guesses. There is only one, okay? That is the trace that we'll take, okay? So we'll now take a trace of this. Okay. 
And so first we define the trace RAB equals, okay, this is now the trace of R C A C D. Okay. And this we now refer to as the Ricci tensor. Very conveniently, the name Ricci starts with the same letter as Riemann. So we can use the same R in both, okay? It's very thoughtful of the parents, okay? And um, basically, this one I'll write out just for future reference, at least the first terms, there's a G, C, D. And the reason I'm writing this out is because I want to emphasize that what appears in here are all mixed second derivatives. So there's one term, there's partial C, partial D, G, uh, and I already messed up, that is too bad. Uh, partial A, partial D, G, C, B, plus partial C, partial B, G, A, D, minus partial A, partial B, G, C, D, minus partial C, partial D, G, A, B, okay? Plus or terms so that's quadratic in the Christoffel symbols, yes. R, A, R, yes, 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 yes. You would like that to be a B, right? Is that better? Yeah, much better, I agree, yeah. Okay, so that's this. Now, notice that if I take the trace of a rank four tensor, I get a rank two tensor. So I can take another trace. Okay, so we also define the Ricci scalar R as basically the trace of this. And just for completeness, maybe I'll write out how do we formally do this. This would be BD times four RBD, okay, which is the same as four RBB, okay. This is the Ricci. Scalar. Okay. And just for completeness, what do we mean by this metric with the indices upstairs? This is now the in inverse metric. Okay. And it's defined so that A, B, up, G, B, C equals delta A, C, where this is now the Kronecker delta. In other words, this is one when the two indices are the same and zero otherwise, okay? This is just for, for future reference, I'll write that down, okay? Now we know that the field equation must involve the tra possible traces of the Riemann tensor. Now it's a matter of figuring out, figuring out which ones, okay? And we invoke Basically, we can make arguments by saying that we must recover the Newtonian field equation and Newtonian limit. We also want energy to be conserved and invoking those arguments. And there's one combination of the Ricci tensor and the Ricci scalar that gives us these correct properties. And they give us the relativistic field equations, namely Einstein's equations. That's how we get those. So let's see, we erase this. So now we have our field equation. It's this, this G A B, which is the Einstein tensor. G A B is defined as the Ricci tensor G A B minus one half G A B as the Ricci scalar. Okay. This is equal to eight pi TAC, where TAC is the stress energy tensor. Okay. The stress energy tensor plays the same role as the density role in the Poisson equation. We should have anticipated that we now need a rank two tensor on the right hand side just because everything is two ranks higher. And it looks like you have a question, is that right? Or you, maybe you cannot read something. No? Yes, it should be. Excellent. There you go. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah very good. There was a test and you passed. Okay. <laughs> 
Now, this is Einstein's field equation, okay? And in my mind, this is the only equation that deserves two boxes. Okay. So there we go. All right. Now, there are a few comments that we should make about this. Actually, before we do this, we actually include it in the summary too, because now we've completed the summary. So we now have GAB equals 8 pi G divided by C to the fourth TAB. Okay, so basically we see... I just love this, right? Isn't this lovely how basically we can, basically from the development of Newtonian theory, you can get all the equivalent objects in Einstein's theory by invoking these beautiful arguments, okay? Um, you know, a few comments. Basically, you could say, but wait, isn't there a cosmological constant missing in the equation that I wrote down? Yes, indeed, it is missing, okay? And we could have a long discussion, the discussion about the cosmological constant. For some purpose, of course, it should be there, or maybe it should be hidden in terms of other stress energy tensors on the right-hand side. But for most applications that we have in mind for numerical relativity, basically the length scales are so different that we can safely ignore that. Okay. Also, what are these equations? Well, they're partial derivatives, right? It, 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 it basically, no, they, no, that's not what I'm, what I'm trying to say. Basically, these are a set of partial, derivative, partial differential equations, okay? I'm starting to lose it here too, okay? Um, so they're coupled, okay? They're a set of coupled partial differential equations for the metric, okay, which we now have to solve, okay? And that in principle and in general is really quite difficult. In fact, in generic situations, it's impossible to solve those analytically, okay? And um, th that is sad in some way, but on the other hand, that's the whole reason why we're here, because that means we have to solve them numerically, okay? So it's kind of my job security, security hinges on those being complicated, if you want. But and so does yours. So basically, that brings us all to, uh, us together. In fact, we'll spend the rest of the week talking about strategies for solving them numerically. But before we do that, we should write down at least one of the beautiful analytical solutions, because we'll also play with that a lot, and that is the, uh, the Schwarzschild solution. Okay, so let's write that down. Um, so this is the Schwarzschild spacetime. So basically, if we assume spherical symmetry, okay, and vacuum, okay, then we obtain the so-called Schwarzschild solution, okay, ds squared equals minus one minus 2m over r times dt squared plus one minus 2m divided by r to the minus one dr squared plus r squared d omega squared, okay? Where m is basically we could measure basically what is the mass of the space time. And then we would see that that is exactly m. So that is the gravitational mass of the space time. Okay, and air, R, I'm sorry, is the aerial radius. Okay. Now, when Schwarzschild discovered this analytical solution while he was serving in World War I and actually died tragically just months later, he really didn't know what this solution describes. It's kind of the equivalent of a Newtonian point source Okay, it, it point mass, okay? And really that's what we should think about this, okay? Uh, but Schwarzschild was worried about these singularities that happens at 2M, okay? And really it was not until decades later that we understood that what this described is, is a black hole, okay? And what this, this singularity goes away if we look at this solution in different coordinates, okay? And by doing that, we realized that really the singularity here corresponds to physical location in the space time, namely the event horizon. Okay, so there's an event horizon. 
surrounding. Okay, a curvature singularity, which happens at, is at r equals zero. Okay, so there is a curvature singularity. Okay. So, okay, you know what? Now I realize I'm not working. I'm not wording this very well, but I think you know what I mean. The, the event horizon is at uh, is at the location r equals two m. The curvature singularity is at r equals zero. Okay, but the event the event horizon is at r equals two m, and basically an object that has an event horizon that's what we call a black hole. Okay. okay. Now notice that if I let m go to zero then this term goes away, this term goes away, we recover exactly the flat metric and spherical polar coordinates that we wrote down earlier. Okay, so that makes sense, okay? Also, this geometry is unique, that's why I refer to it as the Schwarzschild space-time, but the coordinates are not. We could express the space-time in many different coordinate systems. In fact, basically in the tutorial this afternoon, I give you sign a couple of exercises where you explore different coordinate systems for this, which might be useful for, for certain purposes. Okay? In particular, one, is I'll write down. We could also describe the same solution in terms of so-called isotropic coordinates. Okay, so we'll use this later. Use later in terms of an isotropic radius. Which I'll call little r. Okay this metric becomes ds squared equals minus one minus m divided by two r divided by one plus m divided by two r squared dt squared plus epsi to the fourth times dr squared plus r squared d omega squared, okay? Where this psi is called a conformal factor. And what is the conformal factor in this case? Well, it's a function of R, and I will let you work out this afternoon what that precisely this factor is. You'll see that this afternoon, okay? But why is this called an isotropic radius? Because this spatial part of the metric now looks exactly like the flat metric. So that's the flat spatial metric. I should also be basically give you a little bit of a heads up. We refer to this as an isotropic radius, but we should be more precise in reminding ourselves that this is an isotropic radius on a slice of constant Schwarzschild time. There are also other slices, and in other slices, we can also introduce an isotropic radius, but it would be a different isotropic radius, okay? And you will see that in the tutorial also, okay? Now, that's... All I wanted to cover today, and this, how are we doing on time? Is this a good time to stop? Okay, great. So this is what I wanted to cover today. Again, this was not meant as an introduction to GR. It was meant as a reminder, as a review, okay? I had assumed many of you have seen lots of these things, but I, uh, now we're kind of on the same page. So we, talk, we know what objects we're talking about, and maybe it was a nice way of revisiting some of these old friends. Okay? That's all for today. Is the tutorial this afternoon. There's another lecture coming up, and we'll talk about 3 plus 1 decompositions tomorrow. Thank you.